The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting live from the UK and across the world online, you're now listening to the UK's only live alternative late night talk show, and I'm Kevin Moore. For the next three hours, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On tonight's show, I'll be joined by Richard Smiley, who is one of the world's most distinguished authorities on the mystical and esoteric teachings of Western civilization. And on the second half of the show, I'll be speaking to Robert Zimmerman, who is an award-winning science journalist and space historian who has written four books and numerous articles on science engineering and the history of space exploration and technology. So let's first speak to our, our guest, Richard Smiley, who's joining us via Skype from America. Now, Richard has lived a lively interest in spiritual matters at least from the age of 10. In 1985, Richard received his MA from Oxford. Probably the most important part of his stay at Oxford came from his contact with a small group that was studying the Kabbalah, one of the main stays of the Western esoteric tradition. It was here that he was first introduced to many of the ideas he has discussed in his books and articles. After spending two years at Oxford, Smiley moved to San Francisco in 1980. During this time, he was also continued his spiritual investigations, working with teachings ranging from Tibetan Buddhism to A Course in Miracles. Good evening, Richard. Hello, how are you? I'm very, very well, and thank you for just bearing with us with uh, a few issues there, just getting you on. Um, Richard, um, it's an honour and a pleasure, like uh, to have you on. Um, I've uh, again, you know, been been reading up on some of your work, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, how how did you get started again? I mean, we've mentioned in the in the in the beginning there that you, it was the Kabbalah and uh, teachings that sort of brought you in, but uh, is there more to it? There probably is. Uh, my father was interested in these subjects. My father was a sailor in the U.S. Navy for uh, 20 years, from uh, 1927 to 1947, and he traveled uh, quite a bit. There was an old newspaper clipping about him that uh, had the headline, He Saw the World. And as he expressed it to me, he said, in his various travels to China, and uh, he spent a lot of time in China, uh, in the days before uh, the uh, Maoist uh, takeover, um, he said, you know, there were simply things he couldn't understand that he saw. And he became interested in the mystical side of things. So he had a lot of these books and magazines and, and uh, paraphernalia lying around. This was in the 60s when I was growing up, and um, I gravitated toward them. I found them fascinating. Uh, during my uh, high school and uh, college years, or uh, university years initially, uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. But as I uh, finished my first undergraduate degree, I uh, became more and more drawn to these subjects again. And uh, as uh, you said in your introduction, when I came to Oxford in 1978, there was a freshers' fair of all sorts of uh, curious uh, activities ranging from people who rode to hounds to the people who harassed the people who rode to hounds. <laughs> yeah. And among them was a small uh, Kabbalah group. And this gave me kind of a contact with uh, kind of what I would call the living pith of the Western uh, esoteric tradition. There are many forms of it, and they call themselves by many names. 
But uh, it was very important and very vital to me, much more than uh, the more conventional types of education I got at Oxford, where I studied classics and philosophy, or greats, as uh, they call it at Oxford. Um, and that was really what gave me my start. And then the story goes on from there. So, Richard, why nowadays are we seeing so, such an interest in the supernatural these days? Well, there's a huge uh, discrepancy between what is normally called consensus reality, it's frequently called consensus reality, and what people's experiences are. Um, the consensus reality view is that our reality is solely physical and uh, increasingly economic. If, if it doesn't register in uh, the uh, terms of dollars and pounds and uh, other such units of measure, it doesn't really exist uh, from an economic point of view. If it can't be analyzed in some kind of scientific lab, uh, it doesn't exist from a factual point of view. Now, that is the reality that um, Western civilization is uh, operating on. But there's this whole world of experience that people have and have always had of uh, reality that doesn't really quite match up to that. In the 90s, I was editor of a magazine called Gnosis, which was a journal of the Western inner traditions, which is another story. But... We got enormous numbers of articles from people who wrote in saying, you know, I saw my father, wife, mother, daughter uh, appear to me after death, yeah. their death. And we didn't really even publish these kinds of articles very often unless they were like really striking or really well written, but they still kept coming in. And I had to conclude that the uh, spiritual existence of humanity, the spiritual experience of humanity, rather, uh, is still incredibly manifold, and uh, the conventional ways of looking at reality don't deal with it. And I think this discrepancy is what's causing the kind of interest in the supernatural that uh, I think you just mentioned. Yes, because, I mean, you can count the sort of mainstream shows that deal with the supernatural uh, on, on sort of one hand. And, um, you know, uh, and, and, and the sort of the bigger shows um, are, are just so easy just to sort of poo-poo and, and, and put it down. But um, um, mm. did it uh, frustrate you at some, some point in your life, uh, you know, to want to push towards um, exposing, you know, some, some of this information as, as well? I mean, w was there a frustration on your part that it wasn't being covered properly? There was. Uh, and, you know, since I have some intellectual background, uh, I was particularly incensed that it wasn't covered very well in the intellectual world. And in fact, the leading intellectual journals, this is certainly true in the US, and I'm willing to go out on a limb and say it's true in Britain as well, um, cover these sorts of things up poorly, contemptuously and ignorantly in ways that they would be ashamed to cover other subjects. Why, why is that, do you uh, think? Because they don't want to believe in it. They don't want to take it seriously. They can only face it as a kind of joke to be made fun of to reassure themselves that there's nothing in it. And this is intellectually dishonest in a major way. And there's uh, many ways in which the mainstream point of view is intellectually dishonest with regard to these things. But that's one of them. And um, they just don't want to look at it. They don't want to face it. They want to treat it as all some sort of joke or some kind of, um, I don't know, something like horror movie for adolescents. Yeah. But then as you see a sort of science uh, uh, progresses, uh, a lot of the theories that some of the, some of the intellectual speakers talked about before, like, you know, the holographic universe and, you know, so on, you know, th this is becoming, you know, th there's, there's now talk that this is a, an actual real phenomena, perhaps. Well, that's it. Uh, I mean, there, and, and there too, uh, there are two things going on. One is that, you know, even the very conventional scientific view, if you're, you know, say a professor of physics somewhere, um, your understanding of reality uh, is starting to be at great variance with the ordinary common sense view of reality in terms of uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics and other areas in which uh, I frankly don't have a lot of knowledge or expertise. But there's another side of it as well, which is that uh, mystical paranormal phenomena have been studied scientifically for about 150 years. And 
the existence of such things has been verified scientifically. Um, the scientists do not want to look at it. They do not want to admit it. Uh, and all they can do is try to shoot uh, holes in it as much as they can, and often in very dishonest ways. For example, uh, I work for a publishing company that recently published a book by a very distinguished parapsychologist that was reviewed in the Journal of the Society for uh, Psychical Research, which I actually believe is based in Britain. And this is what it said, and, and this was weird. Granted, under ordinary scientific conditions, uh, the experiments that uh, dealt with parapsychology show its existence. But given the incredible strangeness of the conclusions that we were forced to reach, surely uh, there must be a higher bar we need to set. And the parapsychologist on the other side is saying, you know, look, we, we've met all your criteria. We've met the criteria you apply to yourselves, but you're still not applying it. And what is that? Well, it's mental blindness. I mean, what is it? It's the inquisitors not wanting to look through Galileo's telescope. And I think that's part of what's going on. Yes, I, I do indeed. But like you said before, you know, if there's no data to back it, they won't go there. Um, and, and that's a shame sometimes. Well, even if there is. Yes, and, and that's the fact. And they won't want to look at the data that there is. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Well, you know, like I've you know said to people before, sometimes science seems to be becoming its own religion in a sense as well. Well, that's true. Uh, if you take a religion as a uh, particularly as a set of dogmatic beliefs that you have to adhere to in spite of whatever evidence uh, offer, or, uh, you know, is offered. You know, there's the famous. Uh, jocular description of faith as, you know, believing what you know ain't so. And, <laughs> uh, you know, that certainly became true of many of the world religions as they uh, grew and evolved and perhaps deteriorated. Uh, it's certainly the case uh, with science uh, or scientism, which is uh, the term for science uh, conceived as a kind of religion. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, what I like about your work is it, it, it's so varied as well. And I'm going to go straight into a, a bit of a, a, an off-the-wall question. But, um, you know, tell us your views on, on Atlantis. I mean, um, you know, did this lost continent actually exist then, in your opinion? Well, that's a fascinating question. Um, and to stay with the science part of it for a minute, um, as we know, the Ice Age ended, uh, the last Ice Age ended around 10,000 BC. And this is remarkably close to the date, the earliest, uh, well, the earliest, the date for the uh, evidence of uh, Atlantis having sunk. The earliest reference to it in world literatures in Plato's Timaeus and Critias. Uh, and what they say is that Atlantis was supposed to have sunk in 9600 BC which is very close to the end of the last ice age. Um, so scientific, and we know that as a result of the, of the last uh, ice age's ending, that there was land that was uh, formerly above ground, uh, water that is now not uh, below, above water. Um, I saw a curious thing, and you may have seen it yourself, because I think it was in the Daily Mail about this uh, curious thing called Doggerland. And Doggerland, I gather, was this country, land, territory, that uh, extended between Britain and Scandinavia in the North Sea. And various oil uh, explorers and geologists have dug under there and found some evidence for a civilization that existed in, for what they, uh, they what for some reason they called Doggerland. I forgot exactly why they uh, gave it that funny name. But I'm not saying that was Atlantis. Yeah. I'm saying there's evidence of uh, areas in the world which very likely had human habitation that are now underwater. And now as we face the whole global warming issue, we can see areas like the Maldives and the Indian Ocean, which are threatened with very something, something very similar. So just to begin with that, there's no particular reason that a civilization couldn't have existed in that time uh, in some region that is now submerged. Uh, it is also possible that 
this civilization existed where Plato said it did, which is outside the Straits of Gibraltar. Now, there is a, a curious formation called the uh, Horseshoe Seamount Chain, uh, outside, which is the shape of a horseshoe, which is in a weird sort of way what Plato described Atlantis as looking like geographically. Is, was that Atlantis? I don't know. I think it's worth exploring. But I'm saying that there's no reason not to believe that a comparatively advanced civilization didn't exist in that time period that was later submerged. You know, as we're facing consequences of, you know, what happens when like New York City uh, goes underwater, uh, suddenly this becomes a lot less implausible than it was, say, 50 years ago. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, to to think that uh, there was a civilization that was more advanced than us, that there, there seems to be, a, I mean, there's so many textbooks and, uh, you know, there's, there's people out there that have, uh, people like uh, Eka Casey that have documented uh, regressions, you know, uh, again and again of, of um, past lives that they, these people have had uh, in such places. Um uh, you know, it's it, it's 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 a really interesting subject, isn't it? The, the whole Atlantis thing, you know, the whole, the idea of anti anti gravity crafts, and you know, what what mm -hmm. happened to the remnants of Atlantis as well? I mean, did they? Is that part of what what it, what, what the ancient Egypt is? Well, that's that's certainly one uh, widely uh, uh, brooded theory. Um, in terms of advanced civilizations, uh, this is an interesting question. And it presupposes something that uh, we don't um, often uh, consider, which is when we think of an advanced civilization, we almost always think of a technologically advanced civilization. Yes. Like ours with smartphones and Skype and all that sort of thing. But... Uh, there may have been other civilizations that were much more sophisticated, for example, in the use of mind power than we are, that gave no thought to uh, uh, technological advancement. Even the Greeks and Romans had some fairly sophisticated technology that was of very little interest to them. They never bothered to develop it very much. So what if this Atlantis civilization was, by you know, all archaeological evidence, not really much to look at. But what if they had developed mental, what we would think of as magical or occult powers to an enormous degree that we haven't? And all of the occult literature of Edgar Cayce and various other uh, sources uh, indicate that they fell, that Atlantis fell, sank or whatever, whatever disaster befell it, whenever it, it did befall it, yes. was as a result of the misuse of these powers. And our civilization faces a similar crux because we haven't really developed these paranormal powers these, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as we've talked about, our civilization is, is busy denying that they exist. But our problem is uh, we've developed technological power and we're starting to face the consequences of abusing that. Absolutely. Well, Richard, we're going to take a quick break there and we'll be right back after this. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The Moore Show website. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm currently joined by uh, Richard uh, Smalley, who is uh, one of the most distinguished authors on the mystic and esoterical teachings of Western civilizations. Um, Richard, just before the break there, we were just talking about the power of the mind and about the potential power that uh, um, you know, Atlantis, uh, Atlanteans could, could have had with, the, with this mind power. But uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about thought power these days and the idea that you can sort of make anything happen with your mind. Um, what do you think about this idea? I think there's a great deal to it. Uh, I think it's essentially true. Um, let's look at it from a very subjective point of view. Let's say you're going to a party. And let's say you go 
in with the idea that everybody in this room hates me. Let's say you go into the party, same party, the same people, with the idea, which you believe with equal sincerity, everybody loves me. You're going to have a very, very different experience uh, in terms of uh, how you enjoy that party. Now, that's in pretty much uh, uh, in line with conventional psychology. But the mystical and esoteric traditions have always said that it goes further than that, that it's thought that's primarily uh, causative and creative in reality, and reality just sort of does what it's told, physical reality does what it's told. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is a big idea to get your mind around. Um, it's hard to even grasp the implications of it. Uh, do our daily lives uh, in some way corroborate or refute this kind of experience? Well, in a way they do. Um, speaking personally, my thoughts are just, you know, all over the place, ranging from thoughts of kind of great sublimity and benevolence to uh, thoughts of anger and that sort of thing. And, you know, in a sense, they're kind of a confused mishmash. Uh, as a result, you know, we get the mixed world, you know, that I live in and uh, everybody else lives in. If you look at a typical news day, uh, then, uh, you know, they, they definitely advertise and uh, emphasize the uh, bad side of the news far more than they do the positive side. But it's not hard to see that there's an enormous amount of, shall we say, bad thoughts out there. Um, and also a fair number of, uh, shall we say, good thoughts, good intentions out there. And the clash combination and interworkings of these two uh, make up uh, what we know as reality. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Go no, on. no, go ahead, please. Sorry, go, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, now, just one or two hints of experience uh, in my life. Uh, lead me to posit something else, that there is a level of the mind that's created in a much more direct and fundamental and powerful sense. So that if you reach the state of consciousness, what you think becomes real. And it goes without saying that this would be a very, very dangerous level of consciousness to reach in our normal state of mental uh, undiscipline. So the barriers in our own minds to this are very uh, heavily defended. And you see references to these levels and these barriers and these thresholds in the occult literature, which speak very often of the guardian of the threshold or the dweller on the threshold. You have to cross through some fairly uh, uh, major uh, hurdles in your own consciousness and your mind to get to these uh, uh, states of mind, uh, assuming that they're there, uh, they're very heavily um, defended for good reason. So I think those are at least a couple of aspects of this uh, incredibly fruitful idea that uh, thought is creative. Well, I mean, you know, you make me think there that uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that we can we can manifest. If we if if we desire it in, in enough, and if it's for the best of us and others, that, that these things seem to happen. I mean, have you not had that experience? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but then, of course, the question is like, what are you looking for, and uh, is it um, <laughs> you know, is it really uh, useful, or and and how are you going to get it? Um. Actually, I'll, I'll, uh, a couple of stories I could tell in this regard, but I'll tell this one because it was a, yeah. a friend of mine in Oxford. Uh, so it's a, it's a British flavor. I, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Your listeners know uh, in pubs, uh, very often the mugs are hung from hooks above the bar. And my friend uh, decided, as he was sitting in a pub one uh, day, that he would make this particular mug that was hanging over the bar move uh, through thought power. And he stared at it, and he stared at it, and he stared at it, and he stared at it. And eventually the barman came over, 
touched that mug, did not take it down, just touched it so that it set it swinging and took down another mug. And my friend was very sobered by this because he realized what sort of what sort of venues, what sort of uh, means are going to use to to uh, create something like that to make it happen? And it it he took it as a warning. Uh, that is to say, these things can happen. Uh, you can make them happen, but so what exactly uh, are going to be the consequences and the side effects? And that kind of warning is very loudly sounded in much of the occult and mystical literature, at least by people who are, uh, you know, reputable or decent. Yes, absolutely. And um, um, I, I was going to go to a question about prayer there, um, but I can't. If on the top of my head, I can't. I can't think what it was. So you know, you know, just again, just going back to the the title of of your book, um, yeah, supernatural writings of, of, of on un, un, unknown history. Um, you know, it's a it's a great title, and. Um, yeah, I mean, would you sort of switching forward here? Um, th- th- there's another chapter in your book. It's about the Da Vinci Code. Um, you know, you know, wh- why well, was that? Uh, why was it so successful then? Well, it's important to begin with to remember that the Da Vinci Code is a novel. It's a work of fiction, and uh, the author would have been within his rights completely to have made up every last single thing in it. And he certainly made up the plot uh, no one's doubting that, but it's, it's a question of like some of the historical details that are supposedly revealed in the plot, uh, that, uh, are of interest. And some of these don't really hold up very well to uh, critical scrutiny. One is the existence of this organization called the Priory of Zion, uh, S I O N Zion, as we would call it in English. Um, there was like a medieval uh, monastic order called the Priory of Zion, which ceased to exist in the 16th century, uh, and a modern Priory of Zion, which was, as far as anyone can tell, uh, uh, kind of created by a, a right-wing uh, French uh, reactionary in the 1950s. And some of this information um, about, you know, that, that he even planted in the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris, sort of it became part of the archives and uh, uh, became taken as uh, factual evidence. Uh, another uh, thing that's, of course, very uh, interesting and controversial is the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and had children, and uh, that these children eventually ended up in Britain or sometimes the south of France. Um, now, I've had, I, I know uh, one British occultist who said that, you know, yeah, even way before uh, the Da Vinci Code was published and before the books uh, on which the Da Vinci Code uh, was based were published, that this idea was circulating in, in um, kind of occult circles in England. There isn't a great deal of evidence for it. Um, if you look at the Gospels, you know, the, the Gospels in the New Testament, the only things we know about Mary Magdalene are that um, she was the first person to find the empty tomb of Jesus, allegedly. And it also said that Jesus had cast seven devils out of her. That's pretty much what the canonical Gospels say, and those are the earliest uh, references for the most part. So, this is all historically very, very shaky, and we could go into that in, in, in further detail, and I, I don't think you necessarily want me to uh, right now. But why did the Da Vinci Code touch the nerve that it did? Because it obviously touched a tremendous nerve. And I think there are two uh, things going on there. Uh, one is that people almost at a mass level, have realized that the story they've been told about Christian history and Christian origins uh, may not have a great deal to do with what actually happened, or at least represents some fairly major distortions. The other thing that's of interest is that, uh, as the Da Vinci Code emphasizes, there's a resurgence in interest in the divine feminine. And I think both of these things are the sources of its appeal, and we could go into greater detail about either one, but they uh, uh, 
hit a nerve. The book hit a nerve for those reasons. Okay, I mean, you, you know, you've you've, you've talk, we've talked about uh, touched on the the Christ there, but uh, another term we hear a great deal about these days is the the sort of inner Christ or the Christ within. Um, could you talk about how this sort of relates to the historical Jesus as, as well, please? Yeah, it's a very uh, fraught uh, connection because what we know about the historical Jesus is comparatively little. Um, the, the facts that scholars agree on are fairly bare bones, um, that there was a man uh, who... Uh, seemed to be some kind of spiritual teacher who lived in uh, what is today Israel, uh, if you like, Palestine, around 30 AD, and was crucified under a Roman uh, official named Pontius Pilate. That's about it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, early uh, attestation that his followers uh, saw uh, or believed that he had risen from the dead, and that's another kind of body of evidence. That's all the rest is up for grabs and is widely disputed. Uh, a fundamentalist Christian will say, you know, all sorts of things were true, ranging from the virgin birth to, uh, um, you know, every last miracle that Christ was said to have performed. Uh, you know, a more skeptical person will come closer to the, the, the very skeletal point of view that I've just uh, uh, given. Um, so who this historical Jesus was remains very, very murky. And um, I, I would respectfully suggest that scholarship on the subject hasn't really advanced a great deal since uh, 1906 when Albert Schweitzer published a very seminal book called Quest of the Historical Jesus. So that's the historical Jesus. Um, the Christ within is uh, a much more difficult subject and... Uh, from a personal subjective point of view, maybe a much more interesting one. Because, of course, beyond a certain point, you know, well, there was this man named Jesus who taught and lived and he rose from the dead, you know, this 2,000 years ago. So uh, what does this have to do with me? Even if, you know, much of the dogmas are true. The idea of a Christ within uh, is that there is something in ourselves that's deeper than the conventional personality. This is something that, shall we say, at the very, very deepest, deepest core of our being says, I. You'll see that a lot of spiritual traditions talk about delusion, illusion, some, something like that. Um, and one of the aspects of this delusion, I would suggest, is that we mistake this very deep I for more superficial levels of the I, like the body or the personality. It's possible, and many spiritual disciplines are uh, designed to engage this, no matter uh, what terminology they use, to go in and touch this deepest level of the I. And then it starts to get very paradoxical because it turns out that the further in you go, uh, the more this I seems to blend with a collective I, that which says I and everyone and everything. And then language starts to fall apart in your hands. I mean, English, as you know, has three persons, you know, I, you, and he. Um, how would it possibly do justice to the idea that that which is most profoundly I myself is precisely that which I share with everybody else. But if you take this idea seriously, or at least uh, are willing to contemplate it, suddenly you go back to the mystical literature of the world, of all traditions, not just uh, Christianity or the West, and, you know, start to see at least a little bit of what they might have been talking about. Okay, well... In your book, The Writings on the, an Unknown History, um, what was the most exciting chapter for you, for you to write? I mean, what, what, what really got you going? Probably the first one, mm. uh, which was uh, an encounter with a, kind of an old Welsh Kabbalist who lived in Maida Vale in London, 
the 70s. He's, he's gone now. Uh, I probably wouldn't have written this article if he weren't. Um, but um, I met him through this Kabbalah group at Oxford uh, that I mentioned earlier. And um, although my meeting with him was it, at first seemed kind of almost inadvertent or accidental, uh, it, was a, it was a powerful influence on my life. And um, I, I would say it sowed a seed in me. Yeah, that was able to grow I, when I came back to the United States and started looking at these things in the very different uh, context of San Francisco in the 1980s. Uh, but in the first uh, chapter of my book, which was an, called An Encounter with the Ancient Wisdom, it talks a little bit about this experience. And I would say that was uh, definitely the most meaningful chapter in the book uh, that I wrote. And um, obviously, you know, touching on subjects like the occult, um, you know, what is the occult? You know, and why does it have such a sort of sinister reputation as such? Well, that's uh, that's a good question. Occult uh, comes from a Latin word meaning hidden, and in the Renaissance, uh, after the scholastic philosophy of Catholicism had begun to lose its hold. This idea, this, the occult philosophy, it was, as it was called in those days, um, began to resurface. And it had a number of ideas, one of which was a correspondence of levels. That is to say, the unseen levels, in a curious sort of way, uh, have some relationship to and resemblance to the physical uh, realms that we see. Uh, the most obvious uh, instance of that is astrology, where the uh, operations or the movements of the stars seem to have some correlation uh, with events on Earth. And that's a, another big subject that we can go into. But it was the hidden philosophy because it was always, the occult philosophy was the hidden philosophy because, for one thing, it was only of interest to very, very few people and still is. Um, despite the widespread popularization of it, it's still uh, comparatively... Um, little understood and, and uh, little accepted. Um, but it's hidden because it also requires you to look a little bit past the surfaces of things. Uh, suddenly, the physical world is not the sole reality, but there are other levels of reality that interpenetrate with it, that exist alongside it. Um, without going into a huge amount of theory about this, the realm of the psyche, that is to say, our thoughts and feelings and emotions interact in a very profound and intricate way with the physical world. Um, it's true that uh, as modern psychiatry and psychopharmacology seem to like to um, hammer home, that chemical uh, changes in the brain can have uh, 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 changes in mood and state, but you know anyone who's ever gotten drunk knew that, so this is not really all that uh, new or exciting a discovery. Um, but that the mind itself, is to go back to a point I was making earlier, you know, has some formative influence on, on reality as we know it. One common way of, of uh, manifesting this, as I'm, I'm sure you know, is the idea of visualization. Yeah. That is to say, if yeah. you hold an image very strongly in your mind and direct a certain amount of, shall we say, will or, or force to it, it will manifest. I think that's the case. Uh, as I say, I think uh, it may have some unseen consequences or unknown uh, consequences, but you know, that's another matter. Okay, Richard, we'll stay tuned and we'll be right back. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The Moore Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The Moore Show. 
Welcome back to the show. I'm joined on the final section now with my uh, guest tonight, Richard Smalley, who's one of the world's most distinguished authorities on mystical and esoteric teachings of Western civilizations. Richard, um, just before the break there, I'd like to speak about magic. Now, in your opinion, what is magic? Well, one famous magician of the 20th century, Aleister Crowley, defined magician as the art of uh, conf- uh, creating change uh, according to will. Now, I think that's a good basic definition, but it's not really quite specific enough. Let's say it's causing change in conformity to will by means that are normally considered uh, shall we say, unusual or paranormal. I mentioned uh, the law of correspondences and uh, in uh, the uh, previous segment and the idea that there are primordial forces symbolized by the planets that manifest and can manifest here on Earth is a major part of that teaching. Um, The idea would then be to conduct uh, rituals, use talismans, perfumes, drugs even, which is another uh, weird uh, sideline we could get off to, probably shouldn't, um, to um, facilitate these changes. Um, One, I would say over the last 500 years, the emphasis has gone more and more toward the use of thought power uh, in some of the ways that we've already discussed and less toward ritual uh, uh, in terms of performing a magical rite, although there's certainly plenty of people who still do that. Well, Richard, you know, uh, there's some teachings that talk about hidden masters, you know, individuals who keep secluded, for example, but who have powers far beyond those of ordinary people. Um, you know, what, what do you think about this idea? I'm willing to take it seriously. Um, I met a few people who seem to have abilities at, shall we say, levels of comprehension and even compassion that were significantly greater than those of uh, the ordinary run of people. Uh, And it's not very difficult for me to assume that there are, are many people who are, or at least a few people, who are far beyond uh, those in terms of both understanding, compassion, uh, knowledge, wisdom. Uh, And why would they not want to uh, make themselves public? Well, why would they? Uh, If you are a person of of capacities like that, uh, you probably don't have any great need for fame. And you're probably able to meet your own personal needs uh, perfectly well without uh, having to amass some huge fortune. Moreover, uh, you probably get bothered by a lot of people who you didn't really want to bother with, so it would just as well to be uh, quiet about it. There's, of course, uh, a rather uh, stereotypical view of these kinds of masters as living uh, in seclusion in the Himalayas or some sort of place like that. And, you know, it would certainly be uh, very, very foolish of me to say that no such people exist, and they probably do. But I think there are people uh, also with very uh, much higher levels of consciousness, compassion, and functionality that may well exist uh, among us, and um, we don't know about them. We don't recognize them unless uh, they want us to. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you look at some of the great, the great uh, spiritual gurus out there, and um, well, it seems to me like they've come from another planet, some of them. Not, not in the sense of what they believe, but just the way they are. Like you say, you know, they're just so centered, so... Um, so there's something magical about them. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, you know, we can ex- expect to believe that, you know, human capacity is on like a wide continuum. Yeah. You know, the usual bell curve. And there may be people... Uh, who are far beyond this, uh, not only in terms of intelligence, but in uh, capacities that we normally think of as impossible or unattainable. Well, some say that there's, you know, perhaps aliens living among us that are, you know, here helping out, um, you know, moving, you know, society forward and, you know, I mean, is that possible? I mean... 
I think it is. I mean, you know, the whole question of aliens and uh, and UFOs is an enormous mystery. And, um, you know, the great psychologist C.G. Jung uh, over 50 years ago wrote a book called Flying Saucers in which he said, well, people are seeing something and we don't know what it is. And, you know, that was in 1957 that was published. So this is like over 55 years later. We still, people are seeing things, we don't know what they are. I mean, I've read uh, interviews with the heads of the uh, Belgian and Brazilian air forces who said, you know, look, our people are seeing things and encountering things. Uh, we don't really know what, we assume the United States knows a little bit more, uh, but they're not telling us anything. Yeah. So I don't think this can all be written off to just, uh, you know, weather balloons and satellites, that kind of thing. There's something out there. I don't know uh, what this is. I personally have never had a UFO encounter. I've never seen a UFO or anything that I would really describe as that. But it certainly seems to me possible. And uh, what that would imply for uh, human civilization and the goals and directions of human civilization uh, is pretty staggering. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we were just, you know, coming from that question of magic, but, uh, you know, people often look to the East to find the sort of mystical knowledge as well. Um, you know, for you know, example, China and India, but can it, can it be found here in the West? It can. Um, the reason it seems a little more elusive in the West is uh, a great deal to do, has a great deal to do with collective belief. Um, Going back to what we said earlier, belief is powerful, thought is powerful. All right, well, we live in a civilization where the vast majority of people believe this sort of thing uh, just doesn't happen, doesn't exist, it's not real. That itself creates a kind of membrane that makes the sort of experience and capacity uh, somewhat diminished. If you lived in a society where everybody believed in it, uh, I suggest that, that it would seem a lot more natural and probably seem to happen a lot more often and uh, that kind of occurrence would seem a lot more obvious. Well, you know, people sometimes um, um, pick and choose um, the, their religions as well nowadays, a, a lot more often. Um, and there, there seems to be some, you know, a sort of kind of a cafeteria of spirituality these days, where people feel they can, you know, pick or choose what they like out of any of all, all, all religions, shall I say, as well. Um, what do you think mm -hmm. of this? I think it's basically a good thing. Um, normally, the response to this kind of thing, this picking and choosing cafeteria or supermarket spirituality, uh, is one of denigration. But Wait a minute here. What means, what's there to tell me that I can't look at everything, every belief, every doctrine, every teaching in the light of my own experience and say whether this makes sense to me or doesn't? Um, in fact, I, I see a lot more danger in the opposite, whereby you know, you're, you're attracted to a religion or let's even say a cult because there are some you know, real insights that it offers. And then, you know, you're kind of sucked in and you have to believe all sorts of, you know, nonsense and uh, incredible things because of these initial insights. So I say um, we have a real uh, responsibility to ourselves to practice cafeteria spirituality. And I think that's practically the opposite of what uh, <laughs> many, many other people are uh, trying to tell us, <laughs> yeah, particularly the people who want you to buy uh, religious bills of goods. Yes, yes, uh, but, but uh, going back to go, going to yourself, then I mean, what what uh, religion are you, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I don't uh, adhere to any particular religion. Okay, um, uh, I uh, I don't go to church on Sunday, but that may be just as much of a function of the fact that I don't really like getting up that early on uh, Sunday mornings, uh, even even early enough to go to <laughs> a late yeah. church service. Um, you know, I. I I suppose my own fundamental uh, orientation and background is Christian, um, which is as much to say that this is the civilization I grew up in. The, the words in the New Testament, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of John, you know, have a lot more emotional and spiritual resonance for me than, uh, say, the Quran or, or even Hindu or Buddhist texts, as, as, as profound and powerful as they are. 
So uh, and that's why I wrote uh, that book, uh, Inner Christianity, which is one of my earlier works about, you know, an attempt to kind of look deeper into that. So I would say I'm a Christian, but I'm certainly a non-denominational Christian by, uh, by all appearances. Do you feel that, you know, religion could die out one day? I mean, what, what is the future of, of all the religions, would you say, after doing and studying all the work that you've done over these many years? Well, let me go, go back to a, a, a rather, uh, what now seems like a rather charmingly outmoded concept uh, known as the age of Aquarius, which uh, uh, particularly people my age who were young when it was uh, brooded about first uh, uh, may seem a bit uh, passe. But the idea is that there are astrological ages and uh, I'm not going to go into the astronomical uh, details behind that because it would just take too long but um, before the age of Aquarius was the age of Pisces and let's say that began around 500 BC and all of the great world religions and philosophies started to arise around then uh, there was an in fact, uh, the German philosopher Karl Jaspers called it the axial age. It was an age that was kind of an axis, you know, which humanity's uh, orientation turned. Now we're, you know, twenty two hundred years later, we're seeing these religions, um, you know, begin to lose their uh, power. Um, for example. Just to, just to take a silly example, one, one idea uh, that, uh, that says that the old age is passing is that the old gods are mocked. And this was true in classical antiquity when even the pagans started to lose faith in their own gods and started to make fun of them, and satires and plays and that kind of thing. Um, and if you notice, uh, religious images, you know, Jesus, God, church, whatever, are... Um, much more easily made fun of in mass culture today than they were, you know, 30 years ago when some of the stuff would have just called caused gross offense. But um, it's now uh, people don't even think of it anymore. So these old sacred images are losing some of their resonance and, you know, what uh, their, their power. That uh, Nietzsche kind of famously proclaimed the death of God um, as far back as the late 19th century. And there's truth to that only if you take it as the death of God as a specific limited concept that was useful for a particular civilization at a particular time. And since our horizons have expanded, our concept of God has to expand and will expand as a result of this. Um, so a lot of the visions of the great world religions, which are the, project, pro the um, a progeny of this earlier age, uh, are starting to seem a bit wan. Uh, I don't think they'll vanish, but um, the kind of power and hold they have on the human, human imagination, I think, will be um, considerably less than they've had in, uh, in the last uh, thousand, two thousand years. Okay. Now, uh, your, your latest book, um, I mean, uh, where do you intend to go from here? Uh, what, what, what's, uh, what's on the horizon for you, Richard? Well, that's a good question. That's one I've asked myself and not answered terribly well. Um, I've written, uh, published several books now uh, on subjects ranging from love. There's a book of mine called Conscious Love uh, to the Dice Game of Shiva, which is uh, subtitled How Consciousness Creates the Universe, which is about mind and how it relates to reality. Um, so... From my point of view, I've dealt with a lot of the big issues, well or badly. That's not really for, for me to say. It's for other people to decide. Um, so I think more and more I'm leaning toward the more personal memoir, which I haven't really tapped very much, partly out of, I don't know, some kind of uh, genuine or misguided sense of privacy, partly because, uh, you know, it's it's – Maybe more interesting to tell your own story when you're a little bit older. I'm uh, 56 now. I'm not ancient, but I'm not young anymore. Um, so probably in, in the more personal uh, memoir direction uh, than anything else. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, and also with uh, your website as well. Please just plug your websites. 
Oh, yes. It's innerchristianity.com. It's my personal website, and you can find out more about me and my books uh, there and uh, you know, find links to various other things as well. So uh, I'd certainly be glad to uh, see any messages. Uh, you can send me email uh, by that uh, website as well. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to get you back on again because I'd love to cover some of your other books as well, which we've had no time to, to sort of go over. But I'm going to get you back on. Uh, I'm going to link you up on our website as well. So um, anyone uh, listening or watching this uh, will be able to find out more information and more links from our website as well if they would like to get in contact with Richard. Uh, and what I'd like to say is, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I hope your listeners enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, well, our next guest coming up is uh, Robert Zimmerman, who is an award-winning science journalist and space historian who has written four books and numerous articles on science engineering and the history of space exploration and technology. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. 